David Palandro, marine biologist. My name is Emma Stacy, and I'm a chemist. I am Dr. Asad Zidan, and I am a physiology professor. Hi, my name is Amma. I am a surgeon. My name is Istama Harir. I am a dentist, and I work in Germany. Hi, my name is Evan Wesley, and I am the vice president for student activation for the Hello, uh, my name is Sarwat al I am a neurosurgeon and working in uh, Germany since eight years. Hi, Christina. I'm excited to talk to you all today. Okay, so you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Uh, yes. So um, my name is Christina Ethel, and I am a um, actually a recent doctor in benthic ecology. So I study organisms that live in the mud or in the sediment in the ocean. My specialty is clams. And so I look at kind of their population and their distribution and how things have changed and shifted. But my focus is on Arctic clams. So I work in the Pacific Arctic in Alaska, so on the U.S. side of the Arctic. And that's kind of a basis of what I do. Yeah, that's the broad overreach of my my specialty. Um, That sounds really interesting. Would you mind telling us like what a typical day of your job looks like? Yeah, so that really depends. I kind of have three typical days that I can talk about. So in addition to field research and lab research, I also teach. And so a typical day in the field, the only thing that is predictable is that it's unpredictable. Uh, So a lot of times what that looks like is either shift work, so 12 hours of working, 12 hours off and sleeping or relaxing, or it can be that you're working for 24, 26 hours and taking naps where you can. Um, And so that really depends on the size of the ship, the timing of the cruise. So if it's 10 days, 11 days. And usually for me, that looks like getting on a ship in Dutch Harbor, Alaska, um, which is in the island chain. In the Aleutians, or sometimes in Canada as well, in Victoria, Canada, Vancouver Island. And then and we get on and then we sail anywhere from two to six weeks. Um, get off a lot of times in northern Alaska in the indigenous village of Upiavik. But a day-to-day one, we, we stop at different stations and we take a suite of measurements. So one station kind of looks very similar. We put something in the water called a CTD rosette, which is stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. And so it measures like salinity and temperature. <laughs> and you can put all kinds of other sensors on it as well. And then around this thing that we call a rosette, there's a bunch of what we call Niskin bottles. They're these gray bottles and you can fire them at different parts of the water column. So a lot of times when we put it down, we take water samples that are about five meters off the bottom. So you'll trigger a couple bottles depending on how many people need water from that depth. And then there's standard depths as we kind of move up in the water column. And then we also deploy things like uh, plankton nets for zooplankton. There's several different kinds of nets. So depending on what questions they're asking or what they're looking for. And then my favorite part is all the mud stuff. <laughs> so we deploy something called a Van Dien grab, which looks kind of like a giant, it's just a giant metal claw. And it brings up a scoop of mud that we then put in a sieve to rinse the mud away and, and we get the animals that are left. And so that can take anywhere from, and there's sometimes other equipment that gets overboard, it goes overboard depending on the groups that are on board, but that can take, takes about an hour and a half per station. A lot of times we're doing like 40 to 50 full stations. So the days are busy and they're long, but they're a lot of fun. And then if I'm back at the lab, (laughs) they look very different. I essentially stare into a microscope for six to eight hours a day for a work day, IDing the different animals that we've pulled up from the samples from the ship. Or other times I just sit at my computer, which is far less exciting, but a necessary evil of the job. And then on days that I teach, I oftentimes um, am meeting with students or teaching for a couple of hours. And depending on the course and the institution that I'm at is how long I teach for. It's kind of nice. My day-to-day can look really different depending on the time of year, which keeps everything kind of fresh and interesting. And it's never boring, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that sounds like a dream job on anything. Like, to not have it be monotonous like that. It's like every day is different. Exactly. Okay, what's, what was your most, like, interesting fieldwork experience? 
Oh man, um, that's a really tough one. I love field work. It's probably my favorite part of my job. Although teaching is a very, very close second. Um, uh, oh, I don't know. I've had so many great experiences. So I've worked on a Canadian Coast Guard boat. I've worked on a U.S. Coast Guard boat. I've worked on a small um, boat that used to be a crabbing boat that they converted for research. And I've got stories from all of them, but um, there's something that's just kind of refreshing about standing on the deck of a boat in the cold with the wind blowing and hopefully the sun shining, but not always. Um, it just kind of reminds you that, you know, you're floating around in the middle of the ocean at the top of the world. And it's, it's just kind of, sometimes just being there is the best part. Um, yeah. But I've seen walruses, I've seen whales, I've seen polar bears. I mean, the clams are incredible, at least I think so. Not everyone gets as excited about them as I do. I have an upcoming trip that I'm a part of. My PhD and master's advisor, who still is a dear friend, colleague, mentor, um, she has a big cruise program coming up called the Synoptic Arctic Survey. That's a really big international program. And I'm excited about that one. And we're actually going to the North Pole. So I think that'll be really exciting. That might be the craziest one, but I haven't gone yet. So I don't have stories from it yet. I guess we can maybe later on, we can have you here again. We can talk about it. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to. <laughs> well, you mentioned polar bears for a bit. And like in our research, we saw that like with field work, especially in the Arctic region, sometimes they have issues with polar bears. So have you ever had an issue where a polar bear was, was like a dangerous situation with a polar bear? No. So I've never personally had an issue. I do know people that work. Um, I actually just learned this last night talking to other early career researchers at this conference, Arctic Science Summit Week. I did learn. So Svalbard is an island in the Arctic that's part of Norway. And they're actually trained with rifles oh. in case they run into a bear. I, however, have not been. Um, usually boats, it's okay. So there are people on board boats that are trained to deal with it if something were to happen. Um, but generally, they kind of stay away. The closest I've gotten or that might have been of concern was we were getting off the ship in Ukiavik and there was one on the beach, like 100, 150 meters down the beach from where we were getting off the boat. But the community was already aware of it and they were handling it. So that's the closest I've gotten to potentially having a run-in. But usually... <laughs> I've seen them from afar, which is how I like to keep it. Um, <laughs> I have a healthy uh, respect for anything that's larger than me. <laughs> okay, so while we're still on the topic of Arctic fieldwork, so obviously temperatures are really, really low. So do you feel like you've gotten used to that over time? And you know, does that make installing equipment and handling tools difficult? So <laughs> I think I have gotten used to it. Um, we always laugh. Most people wear gloves. I have taken after my, so I've been really lucky. My advisor, her husband is also a faculty member where I did my graduate studies and he is a part of my committee and is also a dear friend and mentor. And he, <laughs> he doesn't wear gloves <laughs> and I started taking after his habits. So I don't know that I've gotten used to it or that I've just accepted that I'm going to be cold on my hands. But there are certain samples that we take, at least from the mud perspective, one of the things we do with Van Dien grabs is when it's closed and has the mud inside, there's a little trap door on the top that you can open. And we take mud samples from it to get the surface sediment. So in theory, it's undisturbed sediment that we can then take samples of grain size and sediment chlorophyll content and total organic carbon. So we take bags of mud, but we want just that top layer, like that top centimeter or so of, of sediment. And so sometimes the mud isn't as high up and you have to kind of get your hand down this really tiny trap door and my hands are very small so oftentimes <laughs> I am the one doing this because my hands fit in the hole pretty easily but even I can't really wear gloves it's hard to maneuver the cutoff syringes to take certain samples and those are challenging to get your hands in with gloves so I have just kind of given up on the glove situation <laughs> But the other thing you can run into, a lot of times we're up there in the summer, and so it's not as cold. It's probably, oh gosh, I should be able to convert to Celsius, but it's about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, so like 10 degrees Celsius maybe-ish, 7 to 10. So it's not super, super cold, but in the winter, my advisor has told me stories of going out in March 
and the hoses will freeze. Mm -hmm. And so you have to keep them warm or you have to, you know, you have to turn them off after every station and bring them back inside the ship. And so I experienced this for the first time in November. Past November, we went out on a cruise and most boats aren't going up there in November, but with melting sea ice, it's more accessible later in the season now. And so we went up there and that was the first time I had to experience like things freezing on deck and we had to bring things inside to keep them warm. And and so it, it can be a little bit challenging with the temperatures, but usually we're up there in the summer and it's not too, too bad, but. Right, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, 50 Fahrenheit is still so cold for me. Like I've always lived in the cold, but like. <laughs> That's fair. My um, temperature, I think, is cute. I've been li living in Iceland for the last three months, and I think it was 45 Fahrenheit one day, and we were all like, this is glorious. It's so warm, because it had been, you know, well below freezing for a while. Yeah, that's um, crazy. So that's fair. 50 can, depending on where, where you're starting from, that can still feel pretty cold. <laughs> okay, so going back to what you said about clams, so obviously you mentioned that you specialize in clams, and during our research process, we came across this article called Looking for Life in Arctic Mud. Mm -hmm. And this article was talking specifically about cockle clams. Mm -hmm. that's pronounced. Mm -hmm. And so you were quoted saying where we were pulling up 20 in previous years, this year we pulled up one. And can you go into a little bit about why that is the case? Yeah. So that cruise actually was funny. It was part of my dissertation work and we had another student that had started in my advisor's lab and, and she wanted this species. It's a, it's a scientific name. It's uh, Cerithes girlandicus or Cerithes laparusi. There's two species of the same genus in that area. And they're a hardy sized clam. They're about five to seven centimeters long. People do eat them or they can eat them. There's some issues with paralytic shellfish poisoning right now. But, um, and I told this other, she was really interested in using them for her work. And I told her like, oh gosh, we're pulling like, you know, 25th, 14th, 15, 16, and 17, sort of, we were getting all these clams and we're like, this is great. You're going to have no problem. And we get there in 2018 and they were gone. And so what we think happened is these guys are really big. They use a lot of oxygen. They're really big oxygen stuff. So they breathe a lot, essentially. Mm -hmm. And we think they got to a point where there were just too many of them. They had prospered really well because there was probably a lot of available food. And they basically, the, the there's a term in ecology called the carrying capacity. And, and we kind of think it hit that carrying capacity of the environment's ability to support that many organisms. And that they essentially almost killed themselves by use, utilizing all the oxygen. Because the other clue there was that when we pulled up the sediment, it was black and very anoxic and it, it smelled bad. And so anoxic being, you know, kind of no oxygen in the system. And so that's our hypothesis. And we've gone back in 2019, 2020, we were there a slightly different time of year because everyone had problems and adjustments and those aren't even the right words to describe what 2020 looked like for a lot of people. And in 2021, we're, we're still not getting the big numbers that we saw in 2014 to, to 2017. But we think what happened was that oxygen, they depleted the oxygen in the system and weren't able to support themselves anymore. I don't know, for some reason I thought you were going to say it's like related to humans I don't know or something, but that's not the case. Yeah. Well, so ultimately, it is interesting. So my, my dissertation work looked at tracking clam populations in the Pacific Arctic. And so I looked at the Serifi species and then another common clam called Macoma calcarea. And that's circumarctic. So you can find that species throughout the Arctic. And the genus you can find throughout the world. So my home base is in Maryland on the Chesapeake Bay. And there's that genus exists there. There's a species called Macoma balthica that you can find in the Chesapeake Bay. But a lot of their population seems to be driven by availability of food and quality of that food. And so that, though, can be affected by kind of melting sea ice and when the sea ice retreats and how the sea ice retreats. So ultimately, this will eventually lead back to, to human interactions with the environment and climate change. And, you know, you can kind of link all these pieces back together and the rate at which they're happening from human activities being involved as opposed to kind of the natural cyclical cycles of the Earth. That's redundant. Sorry, cyclical cycles. Um, but yeah, so the oxygen thing was kind of the immediate thing. But if you parse it out and, and kind of go back up, ultimately, you can also link this stuff, some of this stuff to human activities or actions and such. Yeah. Yeah. So part of it is human activity and, you know, the effect of ice loss. And you know, that is in part our fault. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so. Well, going back to the clams, we, we have to <laughs> talk. I mean, 
I, I know we keep talking about it, but Shahid and I were really interested. And we were kind of curious as to why you chose to specialize in crams of all Yeah, <laughs> It's a common question that I get. I yeah. started teaching at the University of Akre in Iceland this year. And the first meeting with my students, immediately one of them was like, why clams? <laughs> it's a fair question. Um, so I didn't set out to study clams. Um, that was not my goal or intention in life. <laughs> I was lucky enough in high school to travel to the Arctic with a student group from Canada called Students on Ice. And so I was able to travel to Iceland, Greenland and Baffin Island, which is part of Nunavut, Canada, and fell in love with it. And flash forward several years and I was in college and I was paired with a faculty member who had a project looking at the societal role of the Pacific walrus in Alaska, in Alaskan communities. And I talked to this faculty member and I was really excited about the program. And I went to him in my later years of undergraduate, a bachelor's degree. And I said, you know, I'm still really interested in kind of the Arctic and the walrus and, you know, marine mammals are everyone's favorite. They're charismatic, they're big. Uh, he told me like, oh, you, you should talk to this, this woman, Jackie Grubmeyer. And so he put me in touch with her and she studies benthic prey. So she has years of data looking at populations of worms and clams and amphipods, which are, are crustaceans. They're, they look like little shrimp. And I went out to sea with her for the first time. And I think when they invited me, it was before I was a student. And I think their exact quote was, we want to make sure you know what you're getting yourself into. Um, yeah. Went out to sea with them. We sat down and I had had a background, a little bit of a background as a stretch. I had had some experience in ocean acidification, which is this idea that more CO2 gets absorbed into the water and it changes the carbonate chemistry. And, and what you end up with is a lower pH, which can be detrimental to things that build shells out of something called calcium carbonate, clams being one of them. <laughs> and so she had asked me, like, are you still interested in ocean acidification stuff? And I was like, yeah, you know, that's it. And so clam was the natural progression for ocean acidification studies. Turns out, I am not a chemist. <laughs> um, biology is definitely where my heart lies. And so ocean acidification was a little, little chem heavy for me, but um, I got kind of attached to the little guys. And so my dissertation <laughs> with her became, so my, my master's was looking at ocean acidification effects on clams. We brought living clams back to Maryland in 2014 and 2015, and they're still there. Uh, well, not all of them, but some of them are still there. And I, I, I got kind of attached and I, uh, you know, she and I sat down and talked and she invited me and I asked to do a PhD with her. And so we shifted over to kind of population dynamics of clams and respiration studies and looking at clams roles in the ecosystem. And, you know, once you kind of do it a couple of times and people figure out that's quirky enough to be connected to, you kind of, you become the clam lady and it just kind of sticks. <laughs> um, to the point where I have, um, I'm not artistic at all, but I really love color and patterns. And so I express myself creatively with clothes and I have clam leggings. I have, I've had a clam mask for the pandemic. I've, I have clam earrings. I have a clam skirt. My friend sewed me a skirt with clam fabric that I defended my dissertation in. So it wow. kind of just stuck and eventually you embrace the weird. <laughs> A dedicated clown lover. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm really passionate about this. Um, so, I mean, what's the most interesting thing you can tell us about clowns? Oh, man. So, okay, I think my favorite thing, and it's funny because I get asked this also a fair amount because I think people are like, yeah, they, you know, they're, they're just sitting there doing whatever. Yeah. They are relatively sedentary, so they, they don't really move, but there are certain species like the cockles, so the syrupy species, they, they can move a lot. I've had them throw themselves off my lab bench before. I've set them down to measure them and they stick their foot out, which is the part that you eat, and they push it up and they're moving themselves around. And I just think it's so cool that they, yeah. they really can move if they want to. <laughs> Yeah, um, I've never thought about the fact they can move. Yeah, so that's always my it's always my go to and my favorite thing is they're not as like sedentary and boring as people think they yeah. are. That's but really um, yeah, so that's that's my that's my favorite thing or I guess to me the yeah. most interesting thing about clams that's not often discussed. <laughs>
So, I mean, you briefly went over respiration studies um, and we wanted to ask, how does ocean acidification affect respiration in the Pacific Ocean? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, So for me, they were always kind of distinct. So my master's was looking at ocean acidification and my PhD was looking at, at respiration studies. But what's interesting about the connection between these two is, so in a water column in the ocean, you can get stratification. So you can get different layers and different water masses that kind of sit on top of each other. So different salinities and different temperatures. And one of the things that, um, so the Pacific Arctic in the Bering Chukchi Sea is their benthic dominated system. So what that means is that the majority of the biomass and the biology reside on the bottom. So there are animals that live in the water column, but it's a really rich benthic community. And so people, when they are taking water measurements, there's interest in the whole water column, but knowing what's going on on the bottom is really helpful to know how it's affecting a large part of the biological community there. And so respiration is what we do when we breathe. So we take in oxygen and we expel carbon dioxide. And that's exactly what these guys are doing. They're they're essentially breathing in oxygen and expelling carbon dioxide. And so CO2, the addition of CO2 is what people talk about when they talk about ocean acidification. And so the Arctic is a really unique place to study this because the Arctic is a really unique place to study this because gases, which CO2 is a gas, they absorb more readily into cold waters. And so you're in the coldest part of the globe, either north or south. But in this case in the north and so co2 is more readily absorbed and if you have a bunch of organisms respiring on the bottom producing co2 normally that's fine right that's part of the cycle you know we all breathe air as well and but when you have this extra addition from things like burning fossil fuels or you know in whatever form that is flying driving taking a boat to the arctic (laughs) um that is ironic yeah yeah, 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 yeah. We we talk about a lot how we study the effects of we can study the effects of greenhouse gases and then sometimes to do our work we're adding just as you know, but yeah. it's there's trade offs, right? So um but yeah, so you start to add that addition and people are starting to note spots of lower pHs and what we call lower saturation states, which is just basically kind of loosely means that the ability for these animals to create their shells and utilize the calcium carbonate in the water, sorry, the carbonate in the water. And so there is this kind of double-edged sword of you have all these animals respiring, which again, in a normal circumstance would be that's part of the environment, but they are finding these pockets in the bottom near where these animals live um, that are setting up conditions that are conducive to things like ocean acidification, which for organisms like clams, usually what that means is there can be problems with growth. So decreased growth, they don't have the ability to produce new shells or the conditions in the water might be corrosive to the shells. So if you think about, you know, if you were to drop a penny, I don't know if anyone's ever, if you've ever done this, but if you drop a penny in like orange juice or Coke, something that's really acidic, it cleans it, it'll eat away a lot of the stuff. And so it's the same kind of concept with an animal shell is that those waters can become corrosive to the shell. So there, there's kind of an internally too, I'm, I'm not a cellular biologist, but internally there's processes that can be affected by this stuff as well. So yeah. that's kind of the, the relationship between the two. Like I said, I took kind of, I keep a toe in the ocean acidification world, but it's probably my small toe at this point. Yeah, I am. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of where those two can connect. Yeah. Well, that's really cool because I honestly have no idea that clams were that important. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, and so from a human perspective, these clams, um, their prey on the Pacific side, their prey for primarily Pacific walrus and spectacled eiders, which is a endangered diving sea duck. And the sea ducks are really interesting because they're diving off of south of um, a place called St. Lawrence Island. And so they're diving up to 80 meters, which in and of itself is incredible that a duck is doing this to me. But they eat these clams, but there's different species that are more nutritious um, and there's a size class that's the most nutritious so it would be kind of like if if we only ate salads for the rest of our lives that's probably not the best way to live like we need salads and you know lentils or beans or 
meat or whatever, however you get your protein or carbohydrates. And so it's really fun to kind of start to look at. I really enjoy looking at, and, and I'm starting to do this more as I continue, is, is looking at which species are present, what size class is present. And then for the walruses, so <laughs> a paper that I cited recently did the math. You know, adult walrus can consume up to three to 4,000 clams a day, which is like oh, mind boggling. <laughs> Okay. Okay. It's it's just that number. I can't imagine eating three to four thousand of anything ever, let alone in a day. But yeah, so they're eating these animals, but then the Pacific walrus is, is culturally important to a lot of the indigenous coastal communities mm-hmm. in Alaska. So whether it's art, whether it's the coat, the meat, you know, whatever it might be. And so, and so you get kind of this when you simplify it, kind of this linear path of important as a food item too. Um, and so, you know, when we talked about why clams and I did love marine mammals and I've got a soft spot for walruses in particular, but I kind of took the route of studying the marine mammals through their prey source, which is kind of, again, how I got hooked on the clam thing, but yeah, there, and you can eat the, well, not all the species, but you can eat a lot of the clam species as well. So they are in and of themselves can be food sources for humans too. So yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. I mean, I think trying to look into their food source um, to try to get to know the organism better. That's a really interesting approach. Okay, so we want to kind of shift over now to the topic of women in STEM. So we imagine that, you know, you faced a lot of difficulties being a woman in arguably a male dominated field. And so are there any particular, you know, situations or struggles that you've been through in particular? Yeah. So oceanography and and marine science is an interesting one because in the biological side of things, it it does actually tend to be more females. But from the geosciences or the physical sciences, like physical oceanography, chemical oceanography, things like that tend to be male dominated. I, it's fascinating when I go out to sea on the science side, I'm actually surrounded by quite a few women, which is really encouraging. The part that gets a little interesting to see is that the women tend to be the students and the technicians. And we definitely have PIs or primary investigators and or principal investigators and leads and professors that are female. Um, but you start to see the men kind of appear more in those roles. And, and so that's kind of interesting to think about when it's like, are they choosing to stop it? Um, a technician physician, which is a necessary. And I owe a lot to the technicians that have worked in labs and, and, and at sea, but or are students getting discouraged? And, and so it's kind of this interesting path. And I've been really lucky. I have a lot of female role models. So I've always been around really strong, independent, feisty yeah. <laughs> women that kind of, in my brain, it was always like, oh, I can do this because she did it. You know, I've, I've had I've had my incidences. I've had, you know, probably like most females on this planet, regardless of what discipline they're in. I've had the negative ones. I do tell one story that I think it always resonates with me. In fact, my advisor had me tell it the other night at dinner. Um, it resonates with me because I think it brings into perspective too that sometimes culturally it can matter. So I was in cold water training through the U.S. Coast Guard and I was the only female in the class. And I was also probably the youngest. If not, I was like the second youngest. So most of the people in this course were older men who uh, just had to research. They were captains on you know, cargo boats or something. And they have to get this recertification every like five years or so. Yeah. And so we did the classroom portion and then we went down and did the pool portion. And so we're putting on, you know, the survival suits and we're trying to get into life rafts and we're like practicing all the things they told us we needed to know how to do. And I bumped my arm or my leg or something. I like bumped something. And the guy running the course was very clearly ex-US military, big dude, shaved head. I mean, like just screamed of stereotypical military. (laughs) And he looked and he said, are you okay, hon? And I said, yeah, I'm totally fine. No worries. Like, I'm great. And I got out of the pool and he pulled me aside and he goes, I'm really sorry. And I was like, for for what? (laughs) Like, I had no idea what had gone on. And he's like, well, I called you hun and I wouldn't have called any of the other men this, but you're my granddaughter's age and I'm from Baltimore. Like we use hun all the time. And I looked at him and I said, I really appreciate the apology. I was like, to be perfectly honest, I didn't notice. I grew up with a Southern mother. I hun people and should probably be more cognizant of it as well. But I think that was such a great, you know, I've told friends that story is and they're like, oh, we would have been really upset. And, and I understand why. Yeah. But 
I also, for me, culturally, I just, it didn't even register that he called me that. All that registered with me was that another human being was making sure that I was okay. And so I think sometimes it is, I don't want to say it's important to pick your battles because I think when it comes to this the gender stuff, it's really challenging, but there are certain times where there's not always ill intent. That's not to say, there are times where there is ill intent. And so I've been really fortunate that the ill intent has been very low. But it is a challenge and you learn how to kind of push forward. And, you know, I, I grew up with a lot of male friends. I kind of was always playing in the dirt anyway, which again, not to stereotype genders, but like not a lot of my female friends in elementary school wanted to play in the dirt with me. So it kind of, you know, I kind of started at a young age for me, but yeah, um, it is a challenge. And I think, you know, I've been really blessed to, I've been more blessed than other people to be able to look around and see women role models and see people doing it and see yeah. people pushing back. And I, I really, I think one of the best things that young female STEM people can do is find those people and develop relationships with them and, you know, talk to the older generations. They're going to have viewpoints that you disagree with, but they're from a different generation and they went through different things. But there's a woman at, that works at our lab that has become a huge role model and friend. And she was one of the first females on boats in the Antarctic. But to hear her stories and to listen to her being like the first and the only now gives me the sense of, you know, now I have the opportunities and the ability to look around and not only see myself, you know, we might still be the minority, but yeah. but we're starting to have, you know, two, three of us instead of just one of us. Yeah. Um, so it's an interesting one. And I think it's one that'll still be ongoing and hopefully we push forward and, and we take those tiny steps where now I don't have to look around and not see zero other females but For sure. um yeah so it, it's a I've been really blessed but that's not to say that you know there are days where it's noticeable and there's days where it's not and the strong female presences that you can find in your life really make a big difference <laughs> yeah I can imagine I, I, I think it's so important have someone to look up to that you can be like if they can do it I can do it too yeah and I think I think too it's really important I really love talking about this because I think it's important for those of us that are early career, or mid career that might might be starting, you know, I'm always happy to talk about it. And I, I am always happy if someone reaches out, like I never want, I think each kind of level of career has a role that they can do to make this better and kind of, and just talk about, I mean, sometimes just talking about it and reminding people that it exists or like, and I'm trying to make a point here that's not coming out well, but I think... <laughs> Uh, I'm going to blame exhaustion, but I don't really know if that's a good excuse. Um, but yeah, I think those of us that are working in the field should always be open to talking to people. I mean, again, that's why I feel as comfortable and as confident in it as I do, because the people that I've gone to and the people that I'm around are always willing to be a listening ear, always talk about it. Or if something does go wrong or if something isn't right, or if there is a problem, you know, you've already got that connection of someone that you feel comfortable as a, as a human being going to, regardless of what discipline you're in. But yeah, I, I can babble about this <laughs> until, uh, as we say in the Midwest, until the cows come home. But um, I yeah, it's a really important topic. And I think, you know, if you ask, if you have other female guests on here and you ask them the same question, you're going to get a variety of, of experiences and, and answers. Um, yeah. That's a really lovely sentiment, honestly. Um, not to like have an abrupt change of topic, but... Oh. <laughs> well, we were going to do this at the start, but we kind of forgot. But I mean, COVID has obviously affected all of us, but we are wondering how it affected your job specifically since like field work and like traveling and, you know, things like that. Yeah. It, so it made travel very interesting. I actually, much like our last topic, though, not, not as an abrupt of a turn as maybe you thought, um, <laughs> I have had some good luck and some bad luck. Um, I actually feel really blessed at the number of the ability that I've had to go out in the field during the pandemic. So again, my my advisor is a force to be reckoned with is how I describe her to people. So in 2020, we couldn't do a lot of our international work because Canada had different rules and different things going on. And so unfortunately, our crews 
Um, our joint cruise with a Canadian colleague was canceled, but we did try to go out in the field with NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States. You know, it was a lot more time. It was a lot more money because you had to go fly to where the boat was, shelter in place, take tests, et cetera, et cetera. All the things that almost now seem commonplace, unfortunately. We had someone that had a test come back positive and so a group of us could not go. It ended up the person was healthy and fine. It ended up being a false positive, but this was, you know, August of 2020. It was still very new to everyone. Um, so, you know, we spent time and money sitting in Seattle for a week and then we came back. <laughs> but the night after we got told, absolutely, you're not getting on board. My advisor got some sleep. We woke up the next morning and the next thing I know, she's like, all right, we're going to try it on this boat in October. I'm working on some stuff. And I'm like, oh, OK, <laughs> you just tell me when to be where. And I'm, you know, I'm there. And so we got a boat, um, delightful boat to work on the Norseman too. It's a crabbing boat that's been converted for science that I mentioned and great crew, wonderful people to work with. And we flew to Alaska, we quarantined, we tested, we got a private charter plane to Nome, which is a, an indigenous coastal community that, you know, again, so we're, the money, the money went up for sure. Um, got on the ship for three weeks. It was the first time in, since the pandemic that all of us felt normal because, you know, we knew everyone was clear and we had three weeks of, you know, hugging and eating and no masks. And, you know, it was, it was great. And so that, and then in 2021, um, with vaccinations and stuff, we were able to have our joint cruise with our Canadian colleagues again, but again, a lot of time and a lot of money. So what usually is a two week cruise, I was gone for five weeks. So we had to do a two week quarantine in Canada and how that worked was the Canadian government, if they deemed you essential, so they had to deem us essential. We got letters from the government. So that was actually really funny. I, I flew out with one of our new graduate students who had never been in the field before. And then another student who, who lives in the same area, she met us at the airport and my advisors were, I think already there or coming behind us or something. It was just the three of us. It's the summer in Washington, DC. So it's like, you know, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, hundred percent humidity. I mean, I was miserable. I hate that kind of weather. There's a reason I work in the Arctic. Um, and they, this, this woman at the desk was so funny. She goes, I hate, cause she's like, well, you know, there's travel restrictions to Canada. And I said, yeah, I've got this letter. And she goes, okay, well, I, you look like you know what you're doing. And I was like, yikes, what kind of people do you see? I'm in a tank top and leggings. I'm sweating <laughs> profusely. My hair is a mess. Like, I don't want to know what kind of people you deal with if I look like I know what I'm doing. Um, what a skill to have. Huh? What, what's a skill to have? Like, that's so. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh man, this is uh so so we had to have these letters and then we had to go through customs and there was a lot of extra questions and customs. And then three days later, so the first three days have to be spent in a government issued hotel at the airport. You cannot leave. You get 20 minutes of outside time a day in this like blocked off area of concrete. I mean, it was ridiculous. It was, I understood why they were doing it, but it, it, it was a lot. Um, so we had to test to get into Canada and then we tested at the border. And then we tested three days. So when that test came back clean, you were allowed to fly within Canada to finish your next 11 days. We were all negative. We flew to Victoria on Vancouver Island, sheltered in place or quarantined there for 11 days. On the eighth day, we took another test that they gave us at the airport. Someone watched us do it. And then the Canadian government came to make sure that we were actually where we said we were supposed to be. Like they knocked on our hotel room door, this guy in a bulletproof vest. It seems a little bit like overkill, but... Yeah. So they checked on us. And so finally, so now we're three tests into this and we're all clear. We took another test before we got on the ship. We got on the ship. We had an extra week of sailing because we got on in Canada instead of Alaska. And then we took a test three days into being on the boat. And then we took another test eight days into, or something like that. All I know is I took six, six tests within the span of about three weeks to be on the ship. Oh four weeks. So, you know, and then we're on the boat for longer. We got off. We had to work to make sure we could get off in Alaska. So we got off and originally we were told we were going to have to quarantine there for 10 days. And we're like, no, we don't want to stay. We just want to get out. We don't want to interact with anyone. We want to go straight to the plane. And so that took some extra work. So it was just a lot of extra moving steps. We tried again in 2021. It ended up not working. 
once again, somehow we ended up with a cruise and that's how we went out in November. But again, you know, testing and so it's, I feel really lucky because I have a lot of friends and colleagues that weren't able to do their field work at all and things were completely canceled. And I don't know if I just work for the most persistent woman on the planet or what, but <laughs> so it, it did affect it. It was a lot of time and money, but, but we got lucky because we were able to still conduct, at least get something out of every year. But, you know, data was still lost in 2020. We went out in October, which gave us new data and a new perspective in a season we're not usually sampling, but we don't have our July time point like we usually do. And so we've got this long record or what's a long record for the Arctic of data that, that now does have a gap, which is unfortunate, but it's also, you know, comparatively to people's health, probably not as important. <laughs> but yeah, so again, kind of good and bad. Um, well, that sounds really exhausting. I mean, yeah. <laughs> It's a really active lifestyle you have. <laughs> yeah, I think I spent more of my time um, quarantining from failed cruises in 2020 than I did actually on a boat in 2020, <laughs> but, it, but it was worth it. Yeah, well, I feel like we've asked a lot of our own questions. So we do this segment where we ask them questions that some of our ASB students have. So our first question is... Are there any viable solutions to mitigate the melting of glaciers and or icebergs? Yeah, so I read this one and was like, oh no, please don't ask me this question. Um, this is a huge one. I was guessing there are many, many, many dissertations written about this. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yes, uh, <laughs> um, melting ice is not my specialty in the sense of otherwise, you know, how does it affect biological populations, but I would say that this is, this is more of a personal opinion potentially. But I think it's, you know, a lot of times we hear things like use less fossil fuels, find different solution, you know, da 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 da. And I, I think ice is tricky, you know, we have good years, we have bad years. 2012 is the lowest sea ice extent year and it's been a downward trend for a long time. 2012 was the lowest September sea ice extent. So in the Arctic, September is when the sea ice is always at its lowest, but in 2012, it was very small. And, you know, mitigating it is tricky. And I think as individuals, there's, there's absolutely things we can do. And it sounds silly to say, you know, walk or take a bike if you can, instead of driving or a bus or a train or in, instead of individual cars, the, even reading about stuff and, and understanding or knowing what's going on. And these all seem kind of silly and small, but if enough people do the same thing, it can add up. Yeah, it's hard. It's such a large problem that I think the entire world is facing and has to work towards a common goal, you know, and it's answering and I'm not exactly answering this question, but I'm kind of meandering around it with stuff I do know. But, you know, in the Arctic, the Central Arctic Ocean isn't owned by anyone. It doesn't fall within any country's exclusive economic zone. It's historically been ice covered, so this hasn't been a problem. But one of the big topics at the conference I'm at now is the Central Arctic Ocean Fishings Agreement. As ice melts and it opens up, you know, do we fish there? We don't even know if there are fish there. Um, or if, I mean, we might... Some of the fisheries people might know that there are fish there, but like what kind, how many, how big, how little, how, you know, species, what's going on, like very little information exists because it's historically ice covered. And so for the ice scientists and glaciologists that are studying that, it's, you know, from a sea ice perspective, it's it's good to know what the ice is going to do. Because again, it, it opens up all these ecological and biological questions, but then there's also you know, international and national governmental questions of like, well, if somebody wants to fish, can they and should they and who gets the rights and who doesn't get the rights? And so, yeah, I didn't really answer the question, but I definitely danced around it. Uh, <laughs> but, but I, yeah, sorry about that. That's a, that's a big one. That's fine. You had um, an interesting take on it anyway. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> it was a pretty loaded question, so. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you did a great job in answering. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to a question you might be more able to answer. Okay. Um, and so this is actually from an AP environmental science student. Okay. Um, she asks, um, how has habitat fragmentation affected marine life? Yeah, so that's another interesting one. I think when we think about habitat fragmentation, we often think about forests and terrestrial systems. And so I, I really liked this question and I, I don't have a stellar answer for it, or at least one that is a straightforward one again, but I, I really like this question. I think my, the first example that kind of came to mind, like I said, we often think about forests and roads getting cut into forests and, and cutting off animals' abilities to maybe reach trees. 
And the first thing I thought about was kelp forests. So there's something in ecology called a keystone species, and it's often not the most prevalent or not the most, you know, not the biggest biomass, not the biggest abundance, however you're measuring quantity. But um, it's, it's it was interesting to think about this. So a keystone species in a kelp forest system is the sea otter because they eat sea urchins. And if you remove a sea otter, which, you know, they're not, they're, they, I, I believe they're endangered or threatened, but they... If you remove them, you get something called an urchin barren. And so the urchins graze on the kelp. And as they, if, if there's not sea otters there to eat the urchins down, the, the urchins can overtake the kelp and, and create this kind of barren um, part of the forest. And so I imagine if you're in a big kelp forest and you lose a chunk of it, it's acting similarly as to when you remove plots of forest or build a road in the middle of it and create space in between areas of kelp forest. So. I'd imagine it would have a similar effect. I don't know for sure. This is, this is kind of speculation on my part in my understanding of kelp forests. In the Arctic, I would say that a big example would be, again, sea ice. So a lot of animals use it for resting, mating, feeding. Um, so those diving ducks I talked about, they, they are resting on the ice and diving from the ice to get clams. Um, walruses use it as a resting platform and polar bears. Um, and so when that sea ice disappears or it's not as thick or it's not as, or it breaks off and kind of floats away, those animals might not be able to swim to a place to rest. They might not be able to access food easily. They might not be able to get the resources that they need. There's actually been several examples of what they call a walrus haul out where thousands and thousands of these animals are coming up on the beach because they have nowhere else to go and young will get trampled and actually can die in these situations. Um, I think adults too, but I think the young are more vulnerable. Um, so if we think about the sea ice is fragmenting itself. so. That's why I like this question. I've never really thought of breaking up sea ice and, and that kind of concept as habitat fragmentation, but I think it definitely is something that you can think about in the same way with, with that term as, as it maybe is more traditionally used. I mean, that sounds terrible, honestly. Um, but to end, I guess, on a lighter note or a more serious <laughs> note, we have one last question from an AFD student, and it's a, a question. What's your favorite fish? <laughs> Yes, I like this one a lot. So um, <laughs> I come from a family that my dad's side of the family. My dad is a total black sheep. He studied fire protection engineering, but he did get a degree in environmental health and safety. But his brother, so my uncle, is a commercial fisherman in New England or was a commercial fisherman for most of his life in New England. And his wife is actually an invertebrate biologist, so clams and worms and anything without a backbone and their kids one of them does uh, stock assessment for fish now in Alaska actually and the other one though we, we call him the other black sheep he's a tugboat captain in Boston Harbor but I'm over here I always joke like the thin fish are for my uncle and my cousin and I'm all about the clams and the invertebrates but so I've been surrounded by fish my whole life actually but I'd have to say my favorite are probably any of the flat fishes. So halibut, flounder. I just think it's really funny that they have two eyes on the same side of their head, but that but they like migrate to get that way. So they're not born with both of them on the one side of their head. But one of them kind of migrates so that both are sitting because then they, they are flat on the bottom. And I just think that's really funky. And yeah, so probably any of the flat fishes. So halibut, flounder, those are the only two I'm coming up with right now. But those would probably be my favorite fin fish. That's very insightful. Um, <laughs> it was a bit of a strange question, but you know, we, we thought we'd add that in. Oh no, I like, I like, uh, like I said, I'd still, I mean, favorite fish, I might say shellfish because that's what a clam is, but um, no, I'm happy to, I thought that was fun, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it was a great way to kind of wrap this up. We are really happy that you were able to join us today for our first podcast episode. You were an amazing guest and we hope to hear from you soon. Uh, you know, just update us on your adventures and what you end up doing. Absolutely. Yeah, this has been lovely. And I absolutely adore the title you guys have picked for this podcast. <laughs> I truly, truly love it. My lecture for my class the other day was about how effective science presentations are about telling a story and using storytelling techniques 
states and that at the end of the day, people doing science are just that, they're people and they have their own experiences and their own stories. And I just, I love, love, love the title that you guys have chosen. And I really am grateful and appreciate being involved and invited. And, and I really look forward to listening to the other stories that people yeah. come and tell. Um, I'm sure, you know, all of the ASD students listening to this, um, and I'm pretty sure you inspired anyone who's interested in going into marine biology. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. And and yeah, I really well done. Yeah, you all both did. Uh, I'm very impressed at your, the, I, I'm, I'm losing words now. The effort, that's not the right word, but I really appreciated being a part of this. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much.